So, hello everyone, my name is Lex Weaver. I am the audience engagement editor for The Scope Boston, a digital news site that tells stories of justice, hope, and resilience in the greater Boston area. We practice journalism as an act of service, working to connect communities, inform civic life, and amplify voices that are often overlooked or mischaracterized by traditional media. Today we will be interviewing city councilor and Boston mayoral candidate, Michelle Wu, who just announced her run last week. Congratulations to you, Michelle. Um, I just wanted to um, go jump right in and start off by talking about your very first campaign video. Um, in that video, um, which was, uh, which you had done in three different languages, which is awesome, um, you did take a stance uh, by saying Black Lives Matter. Um, just in the climate that we're in today, um, and a lot of conversations, uh, a lot of folks coming from Black communities feel that politicians often pander to the Black community uh, by stating Black Lives Matter um, in order to secure the vote to get into office. And then when they are in office, um, they're often forgot about or overlooked. Um, so my question, my first question for you today is, um, if elected to office, um, how does your plan for racial equity include Black Boston residents? So first, thank you so much for having me on. Um, it's been a little bit of a whirlwind week um, and I'm so excited to get a moment just to um, connect with all of you and, and to celebrate the incredible work that you all do, um, telling stories and connecting um, everyone in your community to Boston as a whole. Uh, so in terms of, I, I completely agree that, you know, in this moment of historic national activism, our modern day civil rights movement, you really have to push to, see what happens after the words are spoken, right? That there is a, uh, you know, everybody kind of knows what to say or where to show up or, or you know, be part of the protest. Uh, but then what, what's the action that actually takes place following that? And so racial justice is central to our campaign and the reason why I, you know, have been in office and, and why I'm seeking to become mayor of the city, that Boston should be a city for everyone we have the resources, we have the activism, we have the ideas. We just need bold, urgent leadership to lift up our communities. And one of the communities that historically, systemically through policy has been left behind and deprived of the opportunity to build wealth generationally, to find security and, and to pass on that stability is the black community, right? From redlining to economic policies to the very structures of city government today, we continue to see the disparities grow in Boston. Um, you know, I, I don't need to, to go into all the many ways in which it is visible and apparent today. The median net worth of a black family in Boston being $8, right? You think, think of that $8 compared to about $250,000 for a white family. The life expectancy dropping by 30 years over the course of just a couple bus stops between Back Bay and Roxbury. And so, you know, our goal is to attack the racial wealth gap from every angle right great schools to ensure that every single child in our in our city has access to incredible education in the city of tremendous resources um, making sure that our development process is fair accountable and that everyone shares in the prosperity of our city you know, we know that boston has grown tremendously over the last seven or eight, year, eight years and yet these gaps have gotten bigger um, housing and home ownership, um, making sure that we are tackling this and connecting affordability to every development decision that happens, um, and our public health and public safety system, which we have been thinking about as two separate items right now. And when you look at it that way, we're not putting our resources where it makes sense. We need to shift our resources to the public health side of things and think of it as one ecosystem. Um, and then just one example you know, you kind of asked about moving forward, but moving forward, I'm also going to keep pushing on something that I have been doing, which is to really look at where city resources are going when it comes to Black-owned businesses and businesses owned by Boston residents. Um, I'm proud to have been the lead sponsor of an ordinance that I partnered with then um, Councillor Ayanna Presley, now our Congresswoman, of course, back in 2017, to require reporting so we know where every dollar of city contracting goes. And from that, we learned as of 2018, $664 million were spent, totally city discretionary spending on contracts for goods and services. And of that, 0.65% of those contracts went to businesses owned by people of color. And 
just, you know, less than 1% to businesses owned by women, just about 1% to businesses owned by Boston residents. That is something that is right within reach of us doing. We need to set those targets and ensure that every possible step we can take, we are focusing resources to close that racial wealth gap. So would you say that um, if elected to office, that would be one of your first initiatives um, when getting into office? And if it's not, what would be your first initiative? Yeah, I think the, I mean, that one's ongoing. It's, I've, I've already been pushing that initiative. And so hope, yeah, certainly that one will continue. Um, I think in general, there are a lot of policies that we need to address and a lot of um, changes that we need when it comes to what's the vision for our city and where are we headed. But at the core of all of those is who is benefiting from success in our city, whose voices are heard, who's sharing in the power. And so one of the, um, you know, about a month and a half ago, we had released a Green New Deal and Just Recovery plan for Boston, really focusing on climate justice, which is racial justice, which is economic justice. Um, And one key piece in there is the commitment to do uh, what we're calling a justice audit. And if we're thinking about structural disparities, structural racism, we have to start with the structures of city government. And so we need to look top to bottom at what are the ways in which we're spending our dollars, making decisions, empowering or disempowering community members, and how do we ensure that we come up with a justice framework for the city that will be the vision for how we make every other policy decision moving forward. So I want to kind of shift gears a little bit um, because I want to make sure that uh, we are including uh, questions from the community. Um, I did uh, solicit feedback before this interview and besides housing, I want to say the top concern, um, and it's something that the scope has covered also, um, is just uh, what your platform plans to do um, with Methadone Mile and the need for safety for lower income residents, as well as support for those experiencing substance abuse. So um, uh, South End Roxbury Community Partnerships, they've reached out um, to us a few times, and they've also said that they've reached out to your campaign a few times, and they like what you're doing. They think you have great ideas, but um, them as well as the community, they're looking for um, a more clear cut example of what it is that you plan to do to tackle this issue. Yeah, and um, I'm grateful to them for for just drawing attention to the issue. It's sad that it has come to, you know, uh, community members who as volunteers are feeling like they have no choice but to stand and disrupt traffic every single Thursday evening to just get some attention and resources. Yeah. Um, this, is an, this is an example where the city has really failed uh, to put forward our vision and to act. Um, we have a concentration of services for substance use and recovery in an emergency shelter in a one mile radius that serves the entire New England region. And I think some of what we've heard from um, other, you know, from some elected officials and, and other leaders, the response is either, well, we're working on building the Long Island Bridge, or, you know, let's make sure other cities are taking back, you know, their people so they're not, they're not coming here. Um, I think we need to accept our role as the regional service provider and find things that we need, that we could be doing immediately, not just waiting on sort of a dream of uh, a bridge being built that, that actually I, I, don't, I don't actually believe will connect to um, dramatically changing the dynamic and the situation at Mass and Cast today. So what do we need to do? You know, certainly there are lots of um, kind of service, city services that have been added to address the symptoms of what is happening. Um, needle pickup that has been very responsive. Our public works employees working extremely hard to get right out there as soon as something's reported. Um, you know, there has also been a law enforcement response that I, I think it should be more of a public health response. But the underlying issue is that we need to treat this public health crisis and housing crisis. And until we can find the way to expand access to recovery and um, substance use treatment, medication assisted treatment across the city and the state, uh, we will always have issues with residents not feeling safe, but also the patients seeking services there not feeling safe either. So um, there are 
some hoops to jump through to expand medication assisted treatment. It's a very heavily federal, heavy, heavily regulated federal issue. Um, and therefore it means there's a lot of costs to expanding it. However, with just a little bit of support, either from the state or federal government, um, we could support local community health centers in various neighborhoods going through that regulatory process to get approvals to have um, patients served at those health centers. We could make it make balance it so that there's access all across you know various places as opposed to concentrated in one location, um, and that you know will support access to recovery. The underlying underlying issue is that folks just need housing, right? No matter what, at the end of the day, even if you are getting treatment, even if you are, you know, receiving supports for trauma and, and um, other help that you need, if you're still not able to have a place to go home and, and have that stability of then trying to find a job and, and support your family, it's, it's back down to um, a, a very hopeless feeling situation, which is what underlies the entire opiate crisis. So we need more low threshold supported housing. Um, it doesn't have to be all in one location. It could be scattered site. It could be in partnership with some of our service providers today, but that also needs to be accessible in many other parts around the city and not just concentrated in, in a one mile area. Um, I guess my question would be, um, how, um, how do you plan, um, on actually implementing all of this? Cause I, I, I hear you saying that we'd need this to happen, but how do you, how do you make sure that it happens? Yeah. So the conversation with community health centers could happen anytime and the, the, um, push to make sure that they're getting the resources they need to. One, you know, understand what expanding treatment would look like at that location. Two, um, uh, have some technical assistance getting through the licensing process um, and ideally getting supports, whether it's from uh, a, another level of government or an outside resource. That is all something that city leadership could push. And then on the housing side, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big conversation about how we get to the housing that we need at the affordability levels that people can actually afford. But the bottom line is that we are not currently planning for our city in a way that recognizes just where the need is in different communities. Our zoning code dates back to 1965 at base. Right? We have not done a comprehensive citywide updating of it. And that means that as every individual development is negotiated, there's lots of exceptions happening and it's not being connected to a holistic plan of where we want each of the um, you know, major developments to go. So I have proposed also in the, in the Green New Deal and Just Recovery Plan, a green affordable overlay uh, that would ensure that we have climate resiliency and um, deep affordability in certain areas through zoning. Sorry. Um, you, you kind of touched on housing a little bit, which was one of my next questions. Um, do you, what, um, additionally, what would your plan be to combat uh, the high rent and living costs in the city? And is that a priority for your platform uh, more so over transportation? Housing justice is at the foundation of everything else. I mean, it is the number one issue that comes up when you're talking to residents. You know, just this morning, we were out at an intersection um, in Grove Hall just kind of saying hi to commuters in the morning and the bits of conversation that I could have were all around how do we stop the displacement that is happening in our communities. Um, there's a couple pieces to it, right? First is that we need more units of housing that people can actually afford and we have to find the resources to build that affordable housing. Um, there are some resources that are being left on the table, right? Some of the ways in which we're asking for commitments from developers who are supposed to pay a certain amount into a fund or supposed to complete an affordable housing project, when they're not being checked up on, there have been several instances that um, have come to light where that hasn't happened. And you know, the promise is made when the permits are built, the new you know, luxury building goes up and then the, the affordable housing that was supposed to go along with it didn't end up happening. Um, so even just making sure we're following through and holding everyone accountable to the, to the commitments around affordable housing is a basic step 
And then there are other resources we should be seeking. There's been a proposal for a fee on um, vacant units, right? If there are um, other cities have experienced this uh, situation where lots of housing units, usually high-end housing units are built, people kind of park their finances there and no one ends up living there, right? And, you know, it's a free market. People can choose to do whatever they want with, you know, housing units when you can afford that, that situation. But then we are going to ask for resources from you to pay for the off, to offset the impacts of your decision of, of not having community there, not having people actually living there. Um, those types of resources need to go to build more affordable housing. And then it's not enough just to say, how are we going to build um, and increase the supply of affordable housing? How are we also going to stabilize people who are living in the city today? Right. So rent stabilization and making sure that the state is allowing cities to pursue that is really important. And um, supporting our residents who have built our communities but are feeling incredible pressure while we wait for the um, new affordable housing and, and supply and the affordable green affordable overlays to, to have more of an impact. And then the other thing I'll mention on housing, especially now during COVID, mm -hmm. is that you know, we're seeing this reshuffle it's a big reset moment in so many ways and one of the important ways is that how we previously thought of using buildings maybe is forever changed so there might be some large you know downtown office buildings where companies aren't ever going to return to the same type of everyone working crowded next to each other or the co-worker co-working spaces and things like that so there might be a lot of Stra economic stress from those types of decisions being made that can actually create the silver lining or sort of opportunity, if you will, to rethink how do we get more housing then out of these changes that necessarily need to happen. Um, I do have a question um, about MBTA services. Um, considering that you've kind of helped spearhead, spearhead the conversation of free MBTA rider services and considering the ep economic issues that have happened as a result of uh, the coronavirus, do you still feel as strongly as about transportation costs um, now um, with everything that has happened? And how have your, if, if, if not, um, how have your plans changed for MBTA services? Yeah, I mean, if we saw nothing else during the pandemic, it is just how much people depend on the T, especially our essential workers, especially through Black and Latinx communities, um, and how much we need, we depend on it also to be safe in a place where um, you can maintain your health when you're using it. So the MBTA did a big thing in the height of the pandemic. They made all buses free because it was clearly the safest thing to do. It meant that people didn't have to be tapping all the same surfaces and all crowding near the driver. It also meant that buses could go faster because people didn't have to you know, rummage through their bags to get out the, the cards or cash or whatever. And the faster the bus route goes, the more likely you can just wait for the next bus to come instead of being squished on next to someone in a very crowded one. And so, you know, oops, sorry, I got a phone call. Um, unfortunately, they reversed that, um, fairly, you know, a couple of weeks ago and have decided to start collecting fares again. Um, but it's, not even, uh, you know, when ridership is down so much, they're not going to be able to make up the loss uh, in, in, in operating costs um, through collecting fares. So this is a moment to really rethink everything. We have seen with this pandemic just how much public transportation is a public good. And so we need to start financing it, funding it, and treating it that way. Okay. Um, my last two questions, because I know we have to wrap up. Um, a really uh, interesting question that we received um, that I wanted to ask you is, uh, what are your thoughts on accountability and policing and what policies are you in favor of to address the repair um, and harm that has been done as a result of policing? Yeah, so in general, we need to think about safety and healing as one system. Because when we think about law enforcement on its own and public health on its own, we're not making the right investments relative to what actually delivers safety and health for our um, community members. And so I've put a proposal on the table specifically along with two of my colleagues, um, Councillor 
Lydia Edwards and Counselor Julia Mejia that would divert 911 um, crisis response calls away from law enforcement to an unarmed community safety force that would be trained um, and, and you know, fully professional force, but trained in mental health counseling, substance use counseling, uh, maybe also address traffic stops and other situations where right now we're asking police to show up, but it often, you know, it's not within their expertise. It's not efficient or effective, and it, it, and it leads to sometimes devastating outcomes, and we've seen that right here in Boston as well. So um, I believe we need more accountability where we, you know, in, in every part of the structure. So there's been a conversation with the mayor's task force and city council about a civilian review board and ways to have some independent accountability. I totally support moving forward with that. Uh, we also just need to recognize that you can't just have accountability at the back end without changing the structure of how we're thinking about safety and healing. So really um, emphasizing resources into our public health side that would shift the role of what um, police and law enforcement are, are resourced to do. And then my last question for you today, um, it's a simple one. Um, is there anything that you would like the general public to know about you that I didn't ask um, today? It could be about just you in general, about your platform or your overall mission. Um, I think, I, I, I guess one of the most, um, if you need to know anything about me, it's that I'm someone who never thought I would run for office growing up. Um, I'm the daughter of immigrants and I'm the oldest kid. My parents had just arrived in the U.S. you know a year before I was born and so I've seen from when I was very little what it means to be the, the kid that has to translate for your parents and understand that even the grown-ups in your life face these barriers that are invisible and are set up you know, sometimes designed to to keep certain people out. Um, and today as a mom of two boys, you know, like I can't control their in and out of everything. Um, I really feel the urgency to make sure that we're leaving the best possible city to them and to all of their peers and their generation and, and the generation after. So I'm in this because I've lived it and it's impossible to ignore the issues when you know what it feels like. And especially when you know how big of a disconnect there can be when you most need help and when the services are supposed to be there from government. So um, I just ask everyone to please reach out. This is going to be a campaign that is about lifting up the struggles and the dreams of every community. Uh, we are starting early, relatively early compared to when people usually launch their campaigns because it takes time to get to know communities, to talk about the big ideas, to have multiple rounds of conversation, to, to understand what kind of city do we want to build together? Um, this is a moment where it is not just possible to reimagine what Boston could do, but absolutely necessary. So to get out of this crisis, we need to make sure that everybody has a role in shaping the future of our city.